come, Holy Spirit, and guide our thoughts and meditations this evening, and speak to our hearts as we open ourselves to you. So, if I may, I'll begin with a short passage of the first book of Kings. We are this week, as it happens, looking at the figure of Elijah, which also is somebody who is model for us in the monastic life. But we have the occasion when he was faint-hearted and we would say depressed, discouraged. And in the first book of Kings we have this famous passage which concerns us with regard to our own life in the beginning of chapter 19. He starts with this complaint, I have had enough, take my life, I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down and went to sleep. Then, all of a sudden, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And that has always been taken as a foretaste, a prefiguring almost of the Blessed Sacrament. He's given this supernatural nourishment. And then the same happens again. Take and eat, for the journey will be long. And on he goes for 40 days and 40 nights until he comes to the holy mount of God, Horeb, and there things begin to happen. So that is a point of departure, that our life is very much orientated towards that bread of life, yours in particular, as is mine, for I have some elements very much in common with yours. It's very much centred on Eucharistic adoration in the little hermitage, also in the hours of night, and then a second time towards evening. And it is therefore something which is gratuitous, has no evaluation sense, it is purely vertical and therefore has to be understood for what it is. We're not wasting time. Now, the bottom line for a life of Eucharistic praise and worship is that of gratitude. And I want to attack just that one subject today because one can't handle more than one at a time. And one is enough for one day. So just listen to a few thoughts which I found helpful and may also help you. I'm being told this information in France by the holy monk who taught us. He said in a billet, fréquentant de préférence les grands auteurs, the great authors. And the reason he had in his mind was that they do not age whereas what is recent often fades and has less value than the great masters. And he would pass discreetly to me great authors like Joseph de Mestre and so on, because they were worth getting as part of our mental baggage. So this would be a typical one that people would be inclined not to know about, whereas they've actually formed thousands and thousands of holy souls. This is going right to the heart of the Counter-Reformation Louis de Granada, venerable Louis de, or Luis de Granada, who would have been confessor to kings and queens, a great Dominican who turned down the archbishopric of Braga, which would have made him primate of Portugal, because he was the confessor of Queen Catherine of Portugal, and so on. Somebody who was actually, towards the end of his life, praised by a personal brief of the Pope, Gregory. But he had a gift, obviously, from the Holy Spirit and of divine providence for the time to counteract the uncertainty in the air and to form souls on a personal level and also gregariously, because he was a great, great preacher and writer. Also a man of great culture and used the best of what was out there. And in the spirit of his time, he used illustrations and stories, which all good preachers have done. And they say that there is no shorter route between the human heart and the truth than a story. So here we have him developing this specific theme of gratitude. 
and he makes appeal to nature. He mentions the case which is quoted by a Greek author, Appian. This talks of a certain man who took refuge in a cave. And he happened to find there an animal in trouble. But it was a lion. He was in pain, and he could see that he was in pain. He had a thorn, and it was causing him much discomfort, but being an animal, he couldn't do anything about it. So he took his courage in both hands and approached the dangerous animal, and with great patience extracted the thorn from the foot of this poor lion. Grateful for the kindness, the noble animal ever after shared his prey, what he caught, with his benefactor while he remained in the cave, because this man was actually hiding in refuge. Some years later, this man, having been charged with a crime, so that probably explains why he was hiding, was condemned to be exposed to wild beasts in the amphitheatre. <laughs> when the time of execution arrived, a lion, which had been lately captured, was let loose on the prisoner. Instead of tearing his victim to pieces, he gazed at him intently. <laughs> and recognising his former benefactor, he gave evident signs of joy, leaping and fawning upon him as a dog would upon his master. <laughs> Moved by this spectacle, the judges, on hearing his story, released both man and lion. Forgetful of his former wildness, the lion, until his death, continued to follow his master through the streets of Rome, without offering the slightest injury to anyone. A like instance of gratitude is related of another lion that was strangling in the coils of a serpent, when a gentleman riding by came to his rescue and killed the serpent. The grateful animal, to show his devotion, took up his abode with his deliverer, followed him wherever he went, like a faithful dog. One day, the gentleman set sail, leaving the lion behind on the shore. Impatient to be with his master, the faithful animal plunged into the sea and, being unable to reach the vessel, was drowned. Oh. And he goes to certain things narrated by Pliny in his Natural History. The example of horses that have been sit, seen to shed tears at the death of their masters and even to starve themselves to death for the same reason. And then we have our own friends, the dogs, and we know how faithful they can be. They say he is a man's best friend. The same author gives among other examples, this is Pliny now, an instance which occurred in his own time at Rome. A man condemned to death was allowed in prison the companionship of his dog. The faithful animal never left him, and even after death remained by the lifeless body to testify to his grief. If food were given to him, he immediately brought it to his master and laid it on his lifeless lips. Oh. Finally, when the remains were thrown into the Tiber, he plunged into the river, and having placed himself beneath the body, struggled till the last to keep it from sinking. Oh. 
Could there be gratitude greater than this? Now comes the point. <laughs> if beasts, he says, with no other guide than natural instinct, thus show their love and gratitude for their masters, how can man, possessing the superior guidance of reason, live in such forgetfulness of his benefactor? Now, you will already have an idea of where I am taking you. Our vocation is to be the grateful hearts of humanity. We are keeping company to the one forgotten and to the supreme benefactor. There is the true story told of the expulsions of religious from France under the Freemason government. All the religious were being pushed out. And there was, as it happens, a very strong Trappist abbot who was willing to go to the top and to plead in the Parlement for his case. And his language, like his person, was so forceful that they could do little else but sit back and let him speak. And his thrust was this. So he succès qu'un roi. Well, le roi a son cours, he has his court. And he was trying, in terms that they could understand, neutral terms, to explain that the supreme being had his court. And that was the raison d'être of Trappist monks, the court of the supreme being, representing also all the state. And on he went in neutral language, which was so forcefully conveyed that they made an exception <coughs> in the case of his name was Don Chotard, who wrote, by the way, a <coughs> classic, L'âme de tout apostolat, the soul of all apostolate. He was a great abbot of the old <coughs> style, and through him a certain Trappist presence could remain in France. But anyway, his thrust, remember it, we are the court of the Supreme King, and we are called to be the angel <coughs> of the earth, reproducing in our interior life of prayer and gratuitous presence, and in also our case, our exterior life of liturgy, which means the work of the people, which is the representation, therefore, <coughs> of humanity, serving in a way corresponding on earth to what they are doing in heaven, but audibly, <coughs> physically and tangibly, that king who therefore is receiving from the official representatives of humanity his thanksgiving. <coughs> therefore, that is the optic. It is proportion, it is order. A part of humanity is called out to do just gratuitously that. Hadios, hadios, hadios. It is an unending praise corresponding <coughs> to what is going on in the angelic sphere. Why is it then, he says, that you never raise your eyes to this indefatigable and generous benefactor? Moreover, will man <coughs> forget that the benefits he receives from God are incomparably superior to those which animals receive from men. Will he forget that his benefactor is so infinite in his excellence, so disinterested in his love, overwhelming his creatures with blessings, which can in no way benefit himself? Now, in philosophy, we talk about the principle that there is a radiation from what is essentially good. Bonum est diffusum sui. It is reproduced in miniature in our solar <coughs> system. All the energy which gives us movement, life, growth, anything at all, functions because of what comes physically from the center of our solar system, which is the sun. I heard it, put it this way, 
by the poor Clares, because I, I still have a lot to do actually with the poor Clares of perpetual innovation in Italy. Noi facciamo la cura del sole. We're having the cure of the sun. We're sun-based. And in that way, one can see, especially in the classical monstrance, which has rays coming from it, mine in the hermitage has that, the center of our existence as creatures is right before us. And around him are many, many angels, and we are in their company, praising the source of energy. And indeed, when one comes into your church, one senses it, one is coming into holy ground, and the instinct to, as it were, take off one's shoes, like Moses, is there. Not to say a word, but to let God reign also in the silence. And many people <coughs> say similar things with regard to my little chapel, because it's small, and therefore one is close to the tabernacle. And the children love to come in there, somehow they know. Mm. And when one is there on one's own, coming there in the hours of night, and coming obviously into a dark chapel with just the flickering light next to the tabernacle, one is reminded straight away in the quiet of night, we're coming not into solitude, but into a huge cloud of company. And the closer that one moves physically towards the tabernacle, the more one feels the presence become dense. Because the closer that we are to the tabernacle, the more angels we are encountering. We can't actually see them, but they're there, and there's a whole cushion around us. Also, when it comes to <coughs> consecration, which in the hermit's mass is very intense, because one is often alone, and there one is very much aware that the congregation is watching and waiting. And at the moment of consecration, they're waiting. <laughs> yes, he's come! And all these angels are there, frustrating themselves at the moment of consecration. And children pick up these things very well if you explain it to them. They're fascinated by the sacred. And I've noticed from a very early age, the little altar boys I've got, I've got them since the age of six or seven, they've grown up, uh, they're now, what are they, 11 or 12 or something, but anyway, they have the instinct automatically, no one has ever told them that, but as soon as they're given half a minute, they go into this mode of nosewood prostration before the altar. For instance, when I'm giving Holy Communion to the people, on a Sunday, for instance, because I have the Latin Mass on a Sunday, uh, one of them will be helping me holding the little little platter there to, to protect the Blessed Sacrament, but the other one will be at the altar, but he'd be always in that position like that, and both of them together when the other one comes back. In other words, the Holy Spirit has put that on their heart. They're very much aware of the angelic presence. And it's something also that one is reminded of always when one goes to the main shrine in Ireland, knock. Because Our Lady appeared there, and people forget that it was a Eucharistic apparition. Because what happened was, the venerable priest, he was a holy, holy man, Archdeacon Kavanagh, in a period of great poverty and famine, had no stipends. He was living off providence. No one could pay anything. And so, because of the famine, he decided, because in any case he had no stipends, to offer a hundred consecutive holy masses for the souls of the departed, especially those lost in the famine. And it was on the hundredth that things began to happen. A little girl who was deaf in the congregation started to hear and to praise Jesus. That was the first miracle. And then Our Lady came. And for two hours, in the pouring rain, she stood there in silence at the gable end of the church. The whole, well, not the whole village, but those who passed by in that period all saw her, only a small village anyway, but they all saw her and gave testimony. Nothing was said, it was a silent miracle, but it was very visual. And she was there as Queen of Ireland. On her left was St. Joseph. And on her right was St. John the Evangelist. I think I'm right in the order, but it makes no difference. If it's not, that is the other way around. And St. Joseph was in this position of eyes, as it were, interiorized, not drawing attention to himself, quiet but a presence. 
St. John the Evangelist was in the attire of a bishop, and he was preaching, he had a book in his hand, and he had his finger like this, preaching. But it didn't stop there, because actually the centre of the apparition was there, and it's now portrayed well in the statues there. It was the altar, and on the altar was a lamb, and over it all was a cross, a black cross. But it didn't stop there, because the only moving part of the apparition for those two hours was the other bit. All the time there were angels going round and round and round the lamb on the altar. And one can easily tell that to the little children, that knock is for you. Our Lady is pointing out that the centre is the lamb on the altar, and the closer you get to that altar, to the lamb, the closer you get to all these angels in silence going round and round and round. Well, my sisters, it's our life too. Those angels are going round and round and round. Us! We're right in their midst, as the earthly counterpart of the heavenly court of gratuitous adorers. There are some angels who do nothing but that and are not ever given a job, as it were, on earth. Others, like guardian angels, are. You know that the word seraphim means the burning ones. Seraph in Hebrew is to burn. He quotes another classical author, Seneca. If it be so great a crime to forget this Lord, says Louis, we, what must it be to insult him and to convert his benefits into the instruments of our offences against him? So this is where I'm coming to now, because we have a reason for this adoration, which is Eucharistic in our time. The first degree of ingratitude, says Seneca, is to neglect to repay the benefits we have received. That already is something we can take with us, for many people do not repay with thanksgiving their Holy Communion. In our day, unless the celebrant is particularly aware, he will not protect the real presence as it should be protected by having a quiet time before concluding the celebration and before saying anything else, e.g. about notices or whatever. And also he will not allow people the time necessary to absorb well the encounter and its grace, because many priests seem to think that the worst possible liturgical disaster is to have a moment's silence, and therefore what will they do? They will multiply the number of extraordinary ministers, even abusively, because the conditions in which they are allowed is quite clear from the Vatican. It has to be a very large number. In Poland, they will never tolerate one anywhere until they're talking about 300 is the number they give as the norm for having a reason for an extraordinary minister in Poland. But they've become a casual, as it were, alternative. And in 1998, the Vatican clamped down on this in the interdecasterial declaration on the, ex the participation of the non-ordained in the ministry of the ordained priesthood. And it was an exceptionally powerful document insofar as it was spearheaded by Ratzinger as head of the Congregation for the Defense of the Faith. But it was countersigned equally, with equal force, by other heads of dicastery, which is an extremely rare occasion. Big names are there. Each section was wanting the same thing, and it was then countersigned and published by the Holy Father, John Paul II, in a very powerful form, in forma specifica. In other words, it was a step taken by the whole Vatican together in one concerted effort to address a serious illness, a very grave abuse which was actually detracting from the majesty of God, adored and honoured and treated as such. It is becoming just a very casual affair and also very damaging to the education of our children, because a child needs visual aids. And if he sees his auntie or his grandmother or even his mother treating as she would treat at home ordinary bread, dressed in ordinary clothes, that's the message the child will get, especially if he sees it in his hand like any other food. 
If, on the other hand, he, from the beginning, as those children that I have, and it's full of children, actually, the, the Latin mass I have, for some reason, they, children all over the place, because they have big families, but they know straight away the very language is so utterly different, the clouds of incense, the facing the other way, the kneeling, the receiving a blessing even from their tiny children, and the quietness that reigns in the air, keeps them all quiet, they know, without being taught too many things with words, what it means to be in a different, different realm. And when it comes then to receiving Holy Communion after a careful preparation, in a very solemn Mass, usually the first Sunday after Easter is what we do is in our little Latin Mass, if it is one, or they do it in another celebration somewhere else where they're very well prepared, they are very much aware that Holy Communion is not at all just another suite. And it's something which, on the level of the Church, unfortunately, has been lost in one generation. The, the devil has managed to actually whittle away the faith, not only of the children, but the children growing up, and therefore young adults, because that's what we're up against. We're now in two generations on, and there's not been a transmission of such fundamental doctrines as transubstantiation, a word which one hardly ever hears. So we talk now in schools, children I mean, about holy bread, that kind of thing. It's just not sufficient. So that is not just human. In a very short time, it's demonic, because it's attacking the core, the heart of our Catholic life. And not just in a Catholic country like Ireland, but massively, it's the case. There are brilliant exceptions, Poland and so on, but unfortunately, Satan has had a huge victory. And therefore, that is part and parcel of our life as gratuitous thanksgivers and adorers. We have matter for, yes, reparation, and to make up for this thanksgiving not happening. Because if one looks at very many celebrations, even on a Sunday, the actual culmination of the week, that Holy Communion, that moment of encounter, is extremely banal, and it's almost less important than the exchanging of the sign of peace. And the whole atmosphere, it would seem, is such a human-orientated celebration that God is very little met. And if he is, he can't act because we block him out by too much bustle. True liturgy is giving space, creating sacred space where God and man can meet. If man is in the midst of that space making noises, I'm afraid we are actually refusing the grace. They're there in the air, but they can't get through to us. We let them evaporate straight away. I have to go. Yeah, all right, we'll carry on tomorrow. Um, I'll just conclude this part then, it'll be in two seconds, that's all. It's enough anyway, because we've got to an important point, the raison d'être of the gratuitous reparateur and adorateur of the God of Gods and Lord of Lords. We'll carry on tomorrow. <laughs>